Thank you for the opportunity to uh, give you a walk through the history of the basin. Um, I'll make this as quick as I can and then do a summary. I am providing a printed copy of this material as well. So, 1952 was when all this was getting started, actually 51, when there was a, uh, a boat, 1120 to 34 to go to St. George Island and pursue um, vacation destination, development as a vacation destination. And uh, in, ke in keeping with that, the county contracted with the Florida State Department of Transportation to obtain a pair of ferry boats. This, this was the original platting. And the ferry boat basin was constructed. The Spica and the Sirius um, operated uh, at St. George Island in this basin and, until um, 1965. And this is the photo of the basin as it was, as it had been dredged. I will zoom. Maybe we can turn off the light. Can y'all see this back here? Okay. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Um, you, <clears throat> it's, it's readily apparent that um, the spoil material from this original dredge was placed over here and back in this area where the current causeway is. It's a rectangular basin. It's not a naturally occurring basin. And uh, the, the um, as you'll notice later in the uh, subsequent aerial photographs, this whole area has been receding pretty continuously since that period of time. And the shoreline used to be way out here. So we'll move along. Um, <clears throat> a photo of the dockage in the ferry boat era. Um, just, and uh, for those of you that drive to St. George Island, off to the left at Cat Point is the, uh, is the original mainland side of that ferry boat operation. And I'm gonna show you the existing property and what remains of it. Ferry boat uh, dockage pilings over on the left side and also over on the right side. And the big berm of land that was placed there by Hurricane Dennis in 2005. Uh, you'll also notice in this photograph a, a heavy storm blowing us a gale land from the northwest a lot of white capping offshore, and here tranquility and calm in the interior of the basin. Uh, just a big bit of background on the boats that operated there. Um, the both of the um, ferries were 60 feet of length overall, 35 feet of beam, and a draft of six feet. That was uh, without cargo vehicles or freight. Uh, our passengers uh, more likely requiring an eight-foot depth. And this is a chronicle of the uh, ferry boats of the Hudson River. I think it's uh, interesting to note that uh, vessels of that size operated in this, um, in this area. Um, 1993 is when they went away, and this is the Franklin County Chronicle documenting that departure. They serviced uh, Dog Island as well. I, I noted uh, that there was a dredging activity on Dog Island underway as well, currently before the uh, planning and zoning. So as uh, the ferry boat service subsided, subsided um, the um, basin continued to enjoy a lot of usage and. Um, this next photo is from October 69. 
and I'll zoom in on that too. <coughs> The docks are in good repair. You have a wide open basin. You can see that uh, there has been erosion of the, uh, the land to the uh, to the west, and an encroachment of sand moving in. Nineteen seventy five photos from the Florida Division of Library and Information Services. These are available off uh, the website of that entity, the Department of State. And uh, you'll see in these photographs uh, utilization by commercial seafood harvesting fleet, including numerous oyster boats, a shrimp boat, and recreational vessel, a uh, large uh, catch. The Bryant Brothers, a shrimper, um, numerous order oyster boats uh, from that era and there are other photos uh, you, you can see the dock that used to be here that ran along and here's the uh, catch in the background and a lot of uh, the oystering fleet and more of the same in addition the current NOAA chart number four 11404 shows the depth of that channel access is eight foot. And uh, it's interesting to note that, uh, well, as everyone here knows, uh, there is no other safe harbor on St. George Island to take refuge from a heavy storm. And this is the current NOAA chart. Zooming in on that. Let's see up here, just go do a Google search, NOAA chart 11404, and you will see an eight-foot depth reported here going into the basin. <laughs> then a 1984 photo from December 7th, 84. Um, showing uh, approximately 30 vessels moored in the basin um, and the uh, basin in good condition still. Given the fact that it was December, uh, there was, it's uh, reasonable to speculate, if I can get this thing turned the right way, it's reasonable to speculate this is your commercial seafood harvesting fleet. I'll zoom in on that as well. A little bit more zooming. And continued um, encroachment and narrowing of the channel. And uh, if you want to count these boats, uh, it's, it's 30 to 40, somewhere in that range. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I was around during all this time. I remember these days. I remember the ferry boat. It's a, it's a resource for the community, especially for the seafood uh, industry. And then Hurricane Dennis came around in 2005. Uh, the earliest aerial photos I could find after that was 2007, in which the uh, in which the basin was uh, largely filled in by that uh, storm flood water. Zooming in. This is the way it looked in that period of time. There is a dock and a boat there still, and it, and it was getting periodic usage. Um, this impoundment of sand exists here today. The channel has meandered a little bit. And we'll go forward <coughs> to another photo similar in nature. Showing the same thing and yet another photo, which this, this is an interesting uh, capture in that it, it runs from the basin out through <coughs> where the new dredged channel would occur. And I, th I think it's arguable that the 
Basin was a a, uh, a victim of a god of a, of a uh, act of nature, and that the storm closed in the basin access. It was not I that did that, or no other man that did that. And so it is the renovation of that harbor that is at, at consideration here. I'm not building something that requires fill. Um, and, it's, and, and in that regard, I think it meets that stipulation on the planning uh, documents and ordinances. The uh, basin is still in use today to a very limited extent, and here's a YouTube video that demonstrates that. As a uh, oyster rig comes into the bay, or into the harbor. So now we go to the, the channel maintenance plan. And I'm going to zoom in on this and uh, make some, I think, critical points. For starters, The um, critical habitat zone was established in the 1980s. And uh, I guess everybody thought, well, that, that, that line would be static um, from there on and forevermore. But in reality, the bay shore of St. George Island is continuously receding. I live, my primary residence is on the bay of St. George Island. My father, the former county planner, and I built that house in the 1970s after I got out of the Army. Uh, I have seen that shoreline continuously erode. It's been in the neighborhood of 50 to 100 feet. And Hermine took a good, nice swath off of it as well. And that vegetative cover that was once there is largely gone. It is a changing ecosystem. And the, the receding shoreline is receding into sand bluffs, especially on this property. This uh, survey, this uh, meets and bounds survey of the mean high water line, you can see that right there, is from um, field date 52306. And you can see this is the current line, and, and, and the amount of receding, re, uh, receding shoreline varies. Here it's very large. Here it's less. Hurricane Hermine came in in September of this year and chewed away 30 feet of, of this area and through here. And um, in fact, we, have, we have approached uh, the EP and received a permit to go fill that back in. And we have one year to do it. Um, and in addition, this dune field that you saw in the earlier photograph uh, ex expanded to, into the bay about three or four feet. So it's continually washing from the uplands area, receding in the uplands area, and filling in this eddy, this, this eddy pool, which um, as long as you have turbulence in the water, solids are s suspended in that water. When it comes to an area like this where there's no turbulence because it's, it's, a, it's an elbow, that's where the sand deposits. You see that on the Appalachicola River on the inside of the bends. That's where the sand lays where it is, is because it's no longer turbulent water. Now, so, you know, it begs the issue if the shoreline continues to erode in, in, in my house uh, on the water, and I have neighbors that have riprap walls that um, around their property, I don't. And that as that shoreline continues to erode and it gets within 50 feet of my house, I guess my house is grandfathered in, but I'm not able to go in my backyard and put up a shed to put in my, my tools in. Would that be correct? I guess it would be. Um, you know, what, at what point does the critical habitat zone in? And if it's all that critical, why are we letting it erode into the bay, which is filling in the bay, which is a, is a clear and present problem and danger? Um, where, where, was that thought through back when this is all happening, and is this not, a, is this not a, another act of nature where the critical habitat zone is eroding? And, and, it is, and it's off in the water here by this illustration. 
one of the things that we plan to do in this property, and it, as, as, we'll, as is documented in this in this drawing, is we're going to run a riprap wall 10 feet out into the water to stabilize it. This is, uh, the permit's already been submitted to DEP. We expect, uh, since they're very in favor of these living shoreline type things, um, we expect that that will be approved, and then we're going to come in with Spartina grass between the riprap wall and the uh, post and board retainment wall. Also, zooming out now, I guess it's also implied that um, since th this is a basin, be it man-made or otherwise, that that 50-foot setback would have 50 feet off of the basin as well. Therefore, um, you know, I, I think that Mark was willing to give on that, right, Mark? And, I mean, that that the the fill could go to the edge of the basin and, and thereby cover the um, critical habitat zone. On that, did you did you agree to that at one point? I mean, I. Or well, did you I'll, intend I'll that to be 50 feet back from that as well? I'll agree that that's a natural man-made basin. So it has a little different, um, I think there's a difference. So if it's natural or man-made, it's okay to fill it, correct? Is that your assumption? Well, that would be up to the board to decide. I'm, well, I think the board did decide unanimously, actually. Because all this out here, as I pointed out in the 1959 photograph, is spoil from the original dredge. And, if, and as I go to the topographic chart in just a few minutes, you're gonna see all this at four and five feet of elevation. Th this was original dredge spoil, and there's, there's um, um, there he is. Here's the man that operated the dredge, real live. You know, and, and you'll have a chance to talk in a minute. Um, so I guess by your standard, then the critical habitat zone would not apply to this f dredge spoil fill either. Is that a r rational, reasonable um, conjecture? I mean, what, what, where does it differ? I mean, it's okay to do it here around the basin, uh, and basically it's inconsistent, would be my assessment, right? I mean, if it's okay to do it because it's man-made here, why is it not okay to do it here when it's man-made? Just think about that, and I think these are factors that the Board of Adjustment took into consideration. Um, the spoil area, fill area, if we reduced it to this 50-foot um, basin, you can see this is a, is a um, serpentine type of uh, boundary here. It comes down and around this wetland, and it comes back out to a point, and it comes down around the wetland again, staying out of the wetlands. We, we um, calculate, or our engineer, uh, did a much more thorough job of calculations with the, with utilizing the topographic survey that we had Roddenberry do, and came up with this as the fill area. Um, the fill area could extend over to this upland property as well. If we had surplus fill, um, it could also be mounted up on the property. But uh, we feel like between what's already in the, in the orange hatch, hash mark, and what's over here to the west in this other area, there is sufficient um, land to accommodate the, uh, the fill. I'm going to uh, move on. Um, an attribute of, of this uh, of this basin and uh, in, in harbor is that it will maintain the um, the beach area, a portion of the beach area that was moved in by Dennis, about a third of it to act as a, a stormwater break, as a, a wave break to keep it calm on the inside. And also it will utilize the uh, newly renovated, recently, I guess in terms of 100 years, uh, the lighthouse that was constructed and renovated will be the range marker at the end of the channel. The total channel length is 2,200 feet to reach the eight foot break at the ICW, kind of near where the, the causeway ends. address the shellfish harvesting uh, area uh, of concern um, as this this chart will show you this uh, area right in here I'll zoom in again has 
has been closed to shellfish harvesting um, for a very long time around the basin. And it's ferry pass, yacht basin, whatever. And there are no oysters growing there anyway, from what I can tell. And then, um, the letter from Dax. Proposed project will not result in any closure to oyster harvesting zones. And it notes the, uh, the buffer. Now, on the matter of post and board walls, um, we're certainly not setting a precedent, as, as Dan Garland indicated. There's been many of these um, permitted in the past. And I'll, I'll show you a, a very notable one. And, and uh, this is a golf course. Well, we can't we can't do a post and board wall to restore a harbor, but we can sure do it to build a golf course. And I asked Mark when we looked at this, did he recall being involved with this? I, I don't think it slipped through without anybody reviewing it, planning and zoning. But we didn't recall it. But you know, I understand we got a lot of things going on to keep up with all the details. But th this is a golf course, and it's got post and board walls right on the water. I mean. Come on, golf courses, how many, 18 holes? How, how long is that? And what's the total amount of post and board wall done on that site? And, and, and that, this wasn't disclosed to me. I just happened to be going on checking on a long-term rehab facility for my mother at St. James. And I was astounded to see this, that this kind of thing would have been allowed. And, and here's another photo of the same thing. and my PDF viewer locked up. <laughs> well, there are other examples, and uh, I will, uh, I guess, wait for the program to respond. Um, at, um, I, I went and did a, a look at the a satellite survey at the St. James Golf Course, and there's a, a lot of post board walls around that on the wetlands, on the water. Yeah, let, let me finish, please. I'm going to answer the question. Well, just Lodge. one second. Let me finish. And then, and then I want to hear your question. Also, at Breakaway Lodge, um, there's a pud that went in there, um, and there is a f four foot post board wall right along the w riverway and the canal um, that goes for the entire length of that property, 26 acres, which is about the same property here, except we have a serpentine structure. But go ahead with your, your question, Alan. I'll repeat that. Okay. Well, uh, these were the examples that I, I found, and um, and I think probably um, it would be good to, to uh, turn it over to the audience. That, but one one thing that came away from the last PNZ meeting that I heard was a, a, an overwhelming consensus of those opposed were opposed because they wanted to keep it as is. Well, that ain't going to happen. You know. I, if, if it comes down to it, and we're denied use of, of being able to put the spoil on the property, um, and, and are faced with transporting it away, and I, I've talked to both Jason White and um, um, Tim Butler, that this this sand, because it has um, detrit organic detritus in it is not building quality sand and cannot be used commercially. It can be used to fill a hole in your backyard, maybe. Um, we, we calculated the, the cost of removal is in the neighborhood of 450 to $500,000. And uh, you go figure the amount of yardage times the amount per truckload, and then the mobilization, uh, transport, demobilization. Um, that, that makes it, the project Unviable, and I and I do have a second phase that if, um, that I had my engineer prepare, and that is to keep the uh, spoil off the critical habitat zone, and do a two-phase harbor renovation. First phase is I would dredge the harbor, use the spoil, and fill the basin, as you noted, as man-made. I believe I can obtain a permit to do that, and I'll move in an RV park and have it there with 80 plus units and monetize the property um, and, and deny 
unfortunately, the, the use to seafood industry and pre pleasure craft and, and things of that nature, um, and you know, that's not what I want to do, but I'm not going to just let it sit there and be thwarted. Uh, I, I tried to open a paddle sports operation last year, and the planning department came up with a thing that was sent to this commission that said, you can't do that because of some con conflict with the, with the regulations, because I had a storage building there, which I'd had a storage trailer there for two years prior, and it, it was from March until September that Mike Shooter finally came back and agreed with me there was no violation. And that, you know, it, it, I, I feel that there's a certain degree of ob obstructionist behavior on the part of individuals that just don't want to deny this, want to deny this harbor renovation to take place. And I, and I believe the hardship definition and the the, um, the the cause of the need to do this project is a result of the act of nature. And I believe that's why the, the variance. A board of adjustments, rather, made this unanimous vote, and, and, I, and I would urge y'all to consider that this is a great project for Franklin County, St. George Island, for seafood workers in the bay, for any mariner that's crossing that passage in a storm. It's got a great economic benefit. We're not setting a precedent that every, anybody and everybody can go bring truckloads of sand and dump it on this critical habitat zone behind their beach house or behind their bay house or behind their property, wherever it may be because we limit the scope of this and say it's only for a harbor renovation project where the spoil cannot be uh, distributed on the property in any other way. That, that is a very unique criteria that's not going to be repeated. I, I noticed on the, on the, uh, the project in um, Dog Island that, that's going through the pool, they did have property that they could dis dispose of it on the spoil. But theirs is a smaller scope. This is a very large scope project. And there's a lot of sand that needs to be moved. So, I, you know, you, you balance out the, the benefit against the cost. And the cost, as Dan Garlick adequately pointed out, is that the vegetative cover, the, I'm gonna, I, I want to go to the topo map. I think that's really important. So I'm going to, I've waited long enough for the program to respond. So it's not going to respond. So we're going to cancel it. <coughs> Hopefully it doesn't lead to a reboot of the computer. And the whole PC has decided to choke down. Ah, I got it back. Bear with me a moment. <coughs> 